In the last chapter of this module, we consider some special behaviors of systems that are known as self-organization and emergence. Self-organization or spontaneous order is a process where some form of overall order arises from local interactions between parts of an initially disordered system. The process is spontaneous, not needing control by any external control instance. It is often triggered by random fluctuations amplified by positive feedback loops. The resulting organization is wholly decentralized, distributed over all the components of the system. In image on the left, we find the results of the self-organized process that creates a dense packing um, of bathers during the occupation of a beach. So in the morning, the first ones come, put um, or reserve their place, and then um, iteratively more and more bathers come and somehow create a dense packing where the visible or invisible borders between these bathers are somehow the, the elements that fill the whole beach. In the middle, we find the dense packing of stones on a vibrating plate and below the self-organized packing of wooden discs in water. So all these examples, they are um, exemplifying the, what was described in the definition above. On the right, we see the typical flocking behavior of birds that emerge from local interactions between the birds but without the central control. So there is no main bird or no boss that says, hey, let's fly in this direction. No, they um, organize themselves. They are all a kind of a democratic group. Nobody says in which direction they have to go, but somehow they organize themselves and um, create this swarm behavior. There are interesting similarities of systems showing self-organizing behavior. On the left side, we see the Bernard experiment, where a thin oil film is heated from below. At a certain moment, the fluid develops a regular pattern of convection cells, or known as Bernard cells. These cells are hexagonal, similar to honeycombs, since this form is the best trade-off between a dense packing of cells without any gaps between the cells and the minimal radius of a cell, which ideally would be a circle. We can compare this pattern with the crystalline model of central places, where we also find a hexagonal pattern, which reflects economic forces that can be interpreted as compromises between the maximal area around the center and the dense packing of many centers in a given space. Emergence results from a system with self-organizing behavior. In philosophy, system theory, science and art, emergence occurs where the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. You may have heard this um, also in the context of Wies van der Rohe as designers and planners, we may be familiar with this, um, but in our context it's really meant literally. For example, if you consider water, you can study the molecules in the atoms, so the smallest parts of this element of the water, but you will never somehow get an idea how water flows around um, obstacles or that it freezes um, below zero degrees Celsius and creates wonderful crystals as we can see them in the illustration behind us, behind me. Um, because it, it's an emerging phenomena, how thousands, millions of molecules somehow work together, creating waves in the ocean and somehow crystals if they freeze. Meaning the whole has properties its parts do not have. These properties come about because of interactions among the parts. The snowflakes are also emerging phenomena that follows a similar growth logic as 
aggregation processes of settlements or cities. So in illustration um, behind me and in the video, um, you can see the similarities of the logic, how these structures are created. So we have simulations that really demonstrate these similarities, for example, in the book from Mike Betty, um, The Complexity of Cities. There we, uh, he introduced these models that explains that with the same logic you can create emerging phenomena of um, the snowflakes or of settlements of cities that aggregate and um, where people aggregate to form this phenomenon. Another system with a pattern that emerge from self-organization are the formation of paths. Animals or humans prefer to use tracks where um, that are made by others. If it's not a too big detour, they will use the tracks that were the track that was laid by someone else. Such a system can be simulated by agents in a cell space. So you remember my introduction, um, for example, using NetLogo. Um, where the cells, they store um, the information that an agent walked across it. And the next agent sees this information and follows um, the track with a certain pro probability. So goes from the mark from one marked cell to the other instead of um, selecting the route through an empty area. The pattern looks similar as paths on a square with fresh snow, for example. We see the footprints of the people walking across it. The paths stay relatively stable in our simulation for at least a while, but sometimes um, you may observe new paths that um, are somehow established, while others may disappear um, because the agents somehow can only maintain uh, a certain amount of paths, a certain distance of paths in total. Therefore, what you can see is an example of a non-equilibrium model. So there is no one state that is the outcome. It always changes, but the pattern it creates always looks somehow similar and related to the older ones. By combining the growth model with the agent model, we can construct a more complex urban simulation model that includes two basic economic forces formulated by Paul Krugman. There is the centrifugal force reflects the need of people to live close together and to create central functions as introduced already with the central place model from Kristalla. And on the other hand side there is the centripetal force that represents the need of people to be far away from others, to occupy a large area of land for themselves, what in turn causes of course um, more or larger travel distances and more traffic. Real settlement processes are always a trade-off between these two forces. What can simulate it in a model as shown in the animation here. Another very good model to demonstrate the phenomenon of emergence is the cellular automata. It is based on a set of rules how cells in a grid change their status depending on the status of the cells in a defined neighborhood. As a neighborhood, often the direct neighboring cells are used. Therefore, the rules of the system only consider very local conditions. Nevertheless, on the global scale, very surprising behaviors can emerge from certain rules. There are, for example, cell configurations that create so-called gliders that seems to move in the cell space. Such fascinating emerging phenomena are the reason why this separate research area on such systems is called artificial life. In the following, we look at the application of cellular automata and agent-based models for the simulation of residential segregation processes, um, which matters in urban simulations and in urban planning to explain how certain groups uh, are located in a city. Residential segregation is therefore the pattern that results from individual decisions regarding the choice where they want to live. 
there is a nice citation that illustrates it. Already more than two millennia ago, Empedocles compared humans with fluids. Some are like water and wine, mixing well. Others dislike each others like oil and water. A simulation for residential segregation is either based on the decision of a cell to change its state based on the mixture of the neighborhood, or if we use agents, an agent decides to move away from a location which, um, a cell, uh, which is a cell to another cell, if the agent is not satisfied with the mixture of neighboring agents of the status of the neighboring agents. The first version is a segregation model for adapting the own properties. So my own state, I can adapt based on the neighborhood. Now try to imagine what happens if we define that at least half of neighbors of a cell have to be in the same state as the considered cell so that it keeps its status. Status means black or white in our simulation, so one or zero, just represented by the colors. If not 50% um, or if below 50% of my neighbors um, are of my state, means the majority of another state, I adapt to this majority and change my status to the one that the majority has. So now try to imagine what pattern may emerge. There are a few examples in the background. Is it a completely random pattern because 50 to 50 um, is a relatively tolerant rule? Or will it come to a very segregated um, pattern where we have big white and big black clusters that are very homogeneous? Surprisingly, as you can see it in the simulation, already with this relatively tolerant individual rule, a highly segregated pattern emerges on the system scale. This pattern is also very robust against disturbances. So if we change many cells randomly, um, as shown in the simulation, the system will come back more or less to the same state as it um, has had in before. And in this final result, we have many white cells where we only have white neighbors and many black cells where we have only black neighbors. Whereas this was not required by the individual cells, but this is the emerging pattern based on this rule. So this is surprising because we have a higher segregation that we intuitively may have guessed um, by this 50 to 50 rule. The second version is a segregation model for changing the location of an agent. Here, the agents do not change their status as in the model before, but they move to another neighborhood if the current one is not satisfying for them. We use the same rule as um, with the last model, means half of the neighborhood of an agent have to have the same state as the considered agent so that it states, stays at its location, otherwise it moves away. Again, we can observe uh, the emergence of a highly segregated clusters of agents, even if the individual agents would be fine with a neighborhood where half of the agents have another state. So to accept half of the people to be different is much more tolerant than we find what we find in the resulting pattern where most of the agents have a very homogeneous neighborhood. We use the last model of an agent-based residential segregation model to show the effect of phase transitions. Starting from model with two groups of agents that are very tolerant, so they accept every neighborhood, we decrease the tolerance level step by step, so they become more and more intolerant, they want to have more and more neighbors um, that they require, that have, should have the same status as themselves. And by decreasing this tolerance, we observe the resulting segregation pattern. And what we can see at a certain stage, a, a kind of chain reaction starts, 
where the movement of some agents cause the movement of others until we have a highly segregated pattern only by decreasing the, the intolerance or the, the tolerance level a little bit. So the people become a little bit more intolerant, but the effect is that from a very mixed state of the whole system, um, it will change to a very segregated state of the system. Similar effects can be found if we consider the behavior of more groups, where we can find some kind of group alliances in the transition phase between um, a very mixed, um, completely random distribution of agents and the highly segregated pattern. In between, we have groups of agents um, where only a few um, groups share a neighborhood. So only group A and B and C may be found in an area, but no agents from D and E and F, for example. The phase transition effect are very interesting for the explanation of social changes that may happen more or less out of the blue without a corresponding important event. A very small event may be the last drop um, that makes the cup run over. Now we arrive at the end of the module on model theory. Now you should have a good understanding of the important role of models for working with computational planning methods. It should be clear how you can develop your own model conceptually and why the understanding of systems is so crucial to realize the potential and limits of a model. The tools and example models should give you a motivating starting point for your own explorations into the topic. I very much hope that I've been able to share my fascination of computation and analysis and simulation methods with you. Ideally, I have opened the door to these topics for you. But as always, um, we provide only um, some entry point for you. Now you have to start exploring these models and play around with the examples uh, that I provide you. Um, and somehow create your own ideas what you can do with these models. So it needs to be linked with your creativity for, of, of you as a designer, as a planner, but um, being able to think logically based on some scientific understandings of systems, of models, of rules, how things really work. And these two worlds, they need to be linked with each other. That's really the main intention of this whole course that you learn how to do this. <clears throat> and as always, we provide some additional readings and links on the following page. Thanks for watching this module. Goodbye.